173 verses in it, 176 verses. I always, I always forget that last digit there. 176. Mm -hmm. 176 verses in it. And uh, we are not going to study every single verse, obviously, of this of this chapter. But I do want to give it, at least it's due to the best of my ability, and not just study a few things and be done in one day. That's actually kind of what I consider doing for today. But when I sat down and started looking at it towards that idea, I found out that I could not study this chapter without at least looking at the first eight verses in their context all together because the the psalmist starts this starts this this chapter out this psalm out uh with basically that as its foundation and then builds upon that and so no matter how much i do over the next couple of days and i do mean that we're going to spend at least three days on psalm 119 counting today um uh, we'll see if i if i feel the need to go even a little bit longer but this chapter deserves its due, uh, being the longest chapter in the Bible and being what it's about. Notice, you will, you will notice, if you've never studied this chapter before, morning Aunt Mary, you will notice, if you haven't studied this chapter before, that this, this chapter, this psalm, is dealing with the Bible. It deals with the importance of God's Word. But we don't know who the author is. The author, I believe, my opinion, and that's that's all it is, is my opinion. My opinion is it's David. David David wrote many of the Psalms, not all of them. You actually have a Psalm that that's that's noted uh, coming from Moses. Okay, and there's other Psalms that are that are also uh, relegated to other people. And David has some Psalms relegated to him. But and and by the way, the relegate when I say relegated to him, there's if you look at your chapters, like for instance, if you look at Psalm 119, it, it, it has in there. No, no, I'm sorry, not that one. If you look at, uh, oh, let me give you a better example, one that does mention David in it. Um, boy, here I am saying David wrote many of these, and I'm flipping my my uh, my pages back. There we go. Psalm 39, for instance, the variety of the vanity of life for the choir director for Jeduthun, a Psalm of David. Well, those those are part of the inspired word of God. Those are those are there telling us exactly who wrote it. Unlike unlike some of the other places we may have within God's word where we assume who wrote the, the that book, like, for instance, the book of Luke is never never signed by Luke, but we believe that Luke wrote it. This right here is, is indicated by God's word to David. That is not something that's put in by my Bible's creator, you know, uh, Thompson Nelson probably. That's something put in, put in way back when the psalm was originated. Okay, So we understand that to be from David. Um, this one is not labeled. We don't know who, it, who it's written from. We don't know that much about it except for what it says it is about. It is about God's Word and the importance of God's Word to the writer. Now, one of the reasons I think David is probably the writer is David is called a man after God's own heart. Well, this is certainly, if David's not the writer, it's a man like David. Because when you look at the life of David, it was very important to him to to uh, to do God's will, to follow God's word. Not that David didn't slip up, <laughs> boy, he he slipped up bad in his in his life. But he he did show when Saul was chasing him, for instance, he would not raise a hand against Saul because Saul was God's anointed, and he recognized what God's word said and how God's word felt that that some that someone should treat one who was anointed of God. David would not do something against against Saul. And so so the things that this this writer, this psalmist says, whoever it is, David or someone else, is is something along the lines of what God would want, what God would say is a right attitude towards his word. Okay? Now, one of the interesting things about this besides the fact that it's the longest chapter in the Bible, this Psalm 119, one of the interesting things about it as well 
is the way it's broken up. If your if your Bible is like mine, you look at the t just above verse one. In fact, it should say this again. I believe this is part of the psalm. It has the word aleph over the over verse nine. The word beth over verse seventeen. The word gimel over verse twenty five. The word daleth or daleth. I don't even know how to pronounce these these Hebrew words. These are Hebrew letters that are being mentioned there. And so each, I'm sorry. Say that again. What'd you say, Bob? I couldn't hear you for for a little bit. Okay. There's still a, there's still a lag between the video and the audio. Okay. All right. I was getting a little bit of that clock sound, and I thought that may have been blocking your audio a little bit there. I don't know. Um, let me know if it happens again that you can't hear me. Okay. Um, each one is broken up with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that's what those are: Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth. Uh, he, hey, I don't know, I didn't pronounce that. Uh, Vav, Hef. They, each one of those are letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And it breaks these 176 verses up in eight verses each. Um, it's, it's like a, uh, the first word of each verse of those portions of the Psalms, of that Psalm, starts with that Hebrew letter. That meant something to the to the psalmist. He, perhaps it was just a way of showing a breaking in his own in his own mind, but it was something that was was put in there, and uh, and so we 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 see that. Um, just want to mention that as far as that psalm is, this psalm is concerned. Any comments on any of that before we get started? Okay. Oh, and one other thing. Um, this is almost the perfect middle of the Bible. If you were to take yeah, your Bibles, yeah. if you were to take your Bibles and close them, and, and from Genesis 1, don't, don't, don't put in your additional concordances and stuff in the middle, but if you take just the Bible portion from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and close it up, and then open it to the perfect middle, it is likely you're going to be in the book of Psalms. It is very possible you will be at Psalm 119. This is this is I mean for for in mine Psalm 119 covers covers uh, six pages, so it's very easy to fall into Psalm 119. But it is towards the very middle of our Bibles, and I, I think that's just a curiosity. I don't think that is something God planned, but but it it's interesting a curiosity that almost the exact middle of the Bible. Is a is a is a psalm speaking about the importance of the Bible, okay? And so uh, and so we want to. I just wanted to note that as well. Let's and our praise of it. And our praise of it. And our praise of it. Yeah, yeah. Understanding that it is the Scripture, and we need to praise it. Right, and we need to we need, yeah we need to hold it in high regard. Exactly, exactly. Right. It, okay. Let's go ahead and read these eight verses, and then we'll just, we'll just cover them real quickly. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They do also do so, they also do know unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I will not be ashamed when I look upon your commandments. I will give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Now, what's interesting about these first eight verses it is it mentions it mentions several different words speaking of God's law. It mentions statutes. Catch me if I miss one. Statutes, commandments, um, ways, precepts, testimonies. The way. He mentions that also. The way. Okay. The way. Oh. Okay. And law. Testimonies and law. 
Uh, you're going to see this, the, uh, those words that are all speaking, as, Psalm, as this first part of Psalm 119 says, shows, they're all speaking of the same thing. These different, word, these different words or phrases are going to be all the way through the book of uh, the, the, this psalm, Psalm 119. Okay, I keep stumbling on this ever since my sister told me these aren't chapters or psalms, uh, and I, I keep uh, maybe I need to stop doing that. The, you know what you know what I'm saying, and I don't know what the difference is. Why it makes a difference whether they're chapters or psalms? Chapters are merely how we break up these these uh, these the books of the Bible. Um, but uh, but yeah, this this psalm is used going to use these words all the way through it. And as Bob said a few moments ago, um, David, or the right, yeah, I'll show you my, my belief. The psalmist here is going to say things about how joyful it makes him, how prayerful he is about these psalms, how blessed he is to have these psalms, I mean, these, these not psalms, these, God's word, how he is able to, it is able to guide his feet I mean, he's just going to talk about that with all those words, showing how important the Word of God is to him. I believe that we ought to have the same attitude towards, towards God's Word. Uh, I think, uh, I, well, it's obvious. God, God thinks we should have that kind of attitude uh, by, the, by the fact that he had this psalm, this psalm in, his, in his Bible. Okay. So, let's look at verse 1. How blessed are those who, who, whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Who is the only man whose way was blameless on this earth? It's Christ. Yeah. So how am I going to be able to do that? How am I able to walk blameless before God? <laughs> with, with, with full attention and uh, determination, we never will. But we can always be undefiled when we've been forgiven, according to First John chapter two. That we have we have that access always to be returned to God according to our desires. Yeah, I would only modify what you said with one with one word, uh, Bob. Uh, we cannot be blameless. We can never be blameless on our own. Is how I would modify right. that. Uh, yes, okay. I should have said that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We are, Christians are blameless when Christ has taken the blame. Mm -hmm. Okay? Jesus Christ, in his life on this earth, was blameless. But he became full of blame when he took our sins on the cross. He lived a blameless life and took the blame. You and I have a blame-filled life. Life that's full of the ability to be blamed. But we are able to have our our sins forgiven and therefore be without blame before God. Okay? Yeah, I, was I, thinking of first, I was thinking of 1 John that as we walk in the light we have fellowship with him. As long as we keep walking then we'll keep, continue to be forgiven. Yeah. And the blood of Jesus Christ forgives us of, of our sin. That's right. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of G his son cleanses us from all sin. That's it. Cleanses us from all sin. Exactly. Um, the, one of the, one of the uh, requirements for a person to be an elder is that he be blameless. Okay? So it does show that we are capable of being blameless. But the only way we can be blameless is for Christ to take the blame. Now, uh, and by the way, Paul the Apostle in Philippians, Philippians chapter 3 said, as far as the law was concerned, talking about himself, blameless. Well, come on, Paul. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. And no one kept the law perfectly except Jesus Christ. Paul was not saying that he never broke the law of Moses. That's what he was talking about in Philippians chapter 3. He grew up under the law of Moses, and I can guarantee you he broke the law of Moses. No one ever lived it perfectly except Jesus Christ. But Paul is noting his, his following of the law, including the sacrifices he offered when he did sin. Understand something, even under the old law, well, obviously so. David is saying it right here. 
the psalmist is saving it right here. I'm going to be saying David at some point in time. Please understand, so I'm just showing my, if I say that, just realize I'm talking about whoever wrote this psalm. Okay, but, but that's who I believe it is. But, but the psalmist is pointing it out. It is a blessing when your way is blameless. And the way to be that way is to have your sins forgiven. Under the old law, an animal was sacrificed when, to cover your sins, drawing off what Jesus Christ would do in the future uh, when he died on the cross. But that caused the person to be blameless. That's how Paul could say those words. As far as the law is concerned, blameless, talking about himself. Then he, then he goes on to say how he, 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 he shoves all that aside in order to reach out to Jesus Christ. Well, you know, whatever, he, whatever was a benefit to him as under the old law, he, he chucked away, he considered to be refuse for the cause, for, to have Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, that, that last phrase, and Bob kind of pointed that out with First John chapter 1, who walk in the law of the Lord. This is not, this is not talking about someone who is perfect, obviously, but someone who walks in the law is going to be following the animal sacrifices when they do sin and not deliberately sinning and, or, and saying, well, I'll just offer an animal later. It's someone who is striving towards following God's will, which, which no one could keep perfectly, but God was able to offer it away for forgiveness. Okay. Now, verse 2. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies. This is just a repeat of what he said in verse 1. Not, not those who are blameless are those who observe his testimonies, who seek after him with all their heart. Now, that's the phrase I want us to note uh, real quick. What, uh, what New Testament verse do you know of that mentions what we should do with all our heart? And love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. Yeah, the lo love the Lord. That's the first and greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. But that idea of loving the Lord with all your heart, same idea being given here. Remember what Jesus said? If you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. So David, or yeah, David, David, David is saying here this idea of, uh, how blessed are those who seek him with all their heart. Seeking him, where are you going to seek him at? You're going to seek him somewhere in, uh, you know, in a garbage dump somewhere? You're going to seek God somewhere in a, in a beautiful uh, valley to look at? Where do you seek God at? Yes, God is everywhere. But to seek him is to look into his word to find out what he would have us to be, to do, okay? And so... so Reminds uh, me of Psalms 1, mm -hmm. that his, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. That's right. We keep him in our hearts. That's what we find him. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Meditating in his in His word, okay? Um, verse 3, those, who, those who, are, who are blameless, those who observe his testimonies, Verse 3, they also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. That's the way they do no unrighteousness. Again, that word righteousness merely means right living, right way of being, righteousness. Okay. Well, unrighteousness would be one who is not doing right. But uh, that word walk modifies it. Yes, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, but we walk in his ways. We are not doing unrighteousness, seeking it to do it, uh, giving ourselves over to it. Unrighteousness. We want to do God's will. Verse 4. Now he's speaking to God. You have ordained your precepts. God's the one who decided upon them, who, 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 who determined what they are. You have ordained your precepts. This, well, I'm sorry. God has, God, yeah, that's true. But what he has ordained is that we should keep them diligently. Okay, look at that word diligently. That, that idea of, of purposely uh, striving towards it, working towards doing his, doing his uh, precepts precepts. 
Um, that is what God has ordained we are supposed to do. Sound very familiar to you? Let me read a verse from, uh, from the New Testament, and then I'll tell you where it's at. That, that way you don't have to worry about going to it. I'm just going to read it, and, and, then you, and then you can see. Okay, do I want just that one verse or the one before it? No, that one verse will do for me. Listen to this verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. That's what we were created for. It's going to break up on you again, Bob. I hear your clock. That's what, that's what we were created for, to do his good works. That's what God ordained. You have ordained your precepts that we should obey them diligently. All right. So the, so the follower of God, the child of God, is someone who is to put effort into doing God's will, going to his word and following it. Okay. Um, verse 5. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Now, I love this particular particular verse of this psalm because it shows the attitude that the follower of God ought to have. Not only does God, has a, God ordained his precepts that we should keep them diligently, but the attitude of the follower of God needs to be one who desires, who wants to do his, his uh, statutes, um, who, who, who um, craves the right attitude to desire to do his statutes. Okay, um, uh, and well, and specifically, what does he mean by that word established? Oh, that my ways may be established. Well, we could look at it as uh, mentally we direct our minds and we have that opportunity. We have that privilege and the ability to direct our minds. So we, we establish his ways in our own minds and then we'll do them. Yeah. Okay. Think about this. And that's right, Bob. Think about this. If I was climbing a mountain and I established a place for me to safely be while I climbed that mountain, what does that word established mean? You, you selected a place. Selected. And I have established myself in that place. I am, I am, I am safely secured in that place. All right. Um, uh, the pilgrims came over here and established a settlement. What does it mean they established a settlement? It means they they made one. They have one. They they are firmly rooted now. They they have a place where they know they're going to be, and they've established it. Okay. Um, so that idea, my ways may be established. That so the psalmist is saying, oh, that my ways may be secure, that I may be set to keep your statutes. Okay? He's looking for a firm foundation in order to, to be uh, safe in God's, in God's way. Verse 6, here's the reason he wants to be established. Then I will not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. Uh, compare this to a, a verse we've talked about in the past, James chapter 1, to looking into the perfect law of liberty like a mirror. Okay, uh, it can it can be real easy for us to look into a mirror and be ashamed, can't it? You know, uh, maybe after a long day of being around people, and you get home and you come to find out you had you had a smudge on your face that you didn't know about. You know, well, you're no longer out among those people, but now you're ashamed. You know, because man, all those people saw me walk around all day with that smudge on my face. How long did I have that on there? I can't believe it. How many people saw me? The shame, or the you know that that would that would cover a person who thought that they were they were ready to meet the world. Well, th this idea, oh that oh that I may not be ashamed when I look on your commandments, looking into God's word and then going, uh oh, oh, I have been doing that for the last for all of my life, and that's wrong, you know. So, He's saying, he's saying, oh, that I may have all my ducks in a row. So when I look in your gut, in your word, I haven't been doing anything wrong. Okay? That's his desire. 
to be there. Now, how many people of us, how many of us are going to be able to go into God's word and never be ashamed? None of us. All of us. All of us. Yeah. That's we're, what happened on the day of Pentecost, and they were pricked in their hearts. There you go. Excellent example of people who were ashamed. They didn't realize that Jesus, or they ignored the fact that Jesus was the Christ and yelled, crucify him. And now they were pricked to the hearts and they realized what they had done. They were ashamed. Excellent example. Okay? None of us can do that, but David is saying here that his desire is to be able to do that. That's how closely he wants to be following God's law. That's how much he wants to have God's law in his heart. This is the right attitude for the follower of God, to, to desire God's ways to be set in stone in, in them and to strive towards that. We'll never get to the point where we, we won't be ashamed when we catch something we did or remember something we did in the past. We shouldn't allow those memories to, to continue with us. Once First Corinthians 15, 58 deals with that also. Steadfastness. You determine in your mind you're steadfast. You're not going to vary from your chosen path. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, uh, and then he says this, um, I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. Now again, that righteous judgments, it's God's word that judges us. He's talking again about God's word, and he says, I'll give thanks to you with uprightness in my heart when I learn your judgments. Why does he give thanks for learning God's word? Understand the end result, actually. Yeah, but towards the idea that he can straighten his life up with God. The, 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 the total attitude in these eight verses is how important the word of God is to the godly man the one who is wanting to follow God. This is, this is a standard to try to reach. The attitude towards God's word is a standard to try to reach, try to reach that attitude, all right? That's not always an easy attitude, especially when God's word speaks about my favorite sin. You know, you know well, I don't want to give that up. No, the attitude ought to be, I'm glad I learned that so that I can be more, like God's son, so that I will not be ashamed anymore uh, of of doing of doing that because I've taken care of it. So that so that I can be right in God's eyes, so I can please my God. You know the the the, the attitude of the of learning something from God's word should not be. A, oh man, I got to stop that. You got to be joking. I, I I like doing that. No, that I'm happy that I now know. One more thing that I can do to get myself closer to the image of God's Son. Okay. Um, verse 8. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. You know what that verse is? That verse is a covenant. And basically it is the covenant that we make with God when we become Christians. He will be our God. We will be his people. We will follow his will, okay? And God will stay with us and protect us and take us home to be with him one day. For the Israelites, when they entered into the promised land, they, they were told by God, you continue in my ways and there's not an enemy that will stand before you. But if you fall into idolatry, if you leave my ways, when you go to war, I'm not going to be with you. There's that idea of do not forsake me utterly. I shall keep your statutes. God promises that us that's exactly what he will do, is he will stay with us as long as we stay with him. He will, he will, he will protect us. He will be with us. That doesn't mean ain't nothing bad will happen to us on this earth, but that means what Paul said when he said, I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I've committed my soul to him, and God will keep it. God will always keep that promise. And, and I mean, he'll always keep the promise. The promise includes, if you don't stick with me, I won't protect you. 
in that way. I won't be your God. That's what Jesus, that's what Jesus said in John twelve forty eight also. Okay. If you do, if you don't keep my words, they're what's going to judge you on that day. Yeah, yeah, my words will judge you on that day. Exactly, exactly. So there's the first eight verses of Psalm 119. And like I said, for the next two or three days, at least after this, we're going to be looking at Psalm 119. I'm going to try and pick some, some things out of it. You look at Psalm 119 as well. And if there's a particular particular portion of this psalm that, that you want to point out as we're going through it, please bring it up. And we will, we will consider it and look at it. I love this psalm. This is, this is my... Julie told you her favorite was Psalm 139, and, I, and I, there's good reason to have that being the favorite. This is my favorite, Psalm 119. I, I love this psalm because of our the way our attitude ought to be towards God's Word. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. I guess we can look at this psalm. Go ahead. I guess we can look at this psalm as an acrostic for our praise of God's Word. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's uh, there is a lot of praise towards God's word. Again, that attitude of recognizing that God's word is not a hindrance; it is a help. And as long if we if we merely see God's word as a blockade, something that keeps me from doing what I want to do, then one that's going to make it very difficult if that's the attitude to keep God's word. Who's going to want to Who's going to want to be close to to understand? to learn more of something that we have that type of attitude towards. So if we have an attitude towards God's word as being a blessing, something that is able to able to help us be who God wants me to us to be, and that's our desire to be who God would have us to be, that's a correct attitude. That's a correct attitude. Okay? Any other comments? Thanks, Albert. Good, good comments. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Let's have a prayer. We'll be closed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to look at your word. Father, we thank you for your word itself. Father, we recognize that it is because of disobedience, each of us, our own individual disobedience, that we have been taken, uh, we have gone outside of your grace, your favor. We wish, Father, to be in your favor. We want to know your will. We don't want to be the disobedient children that we turned ourselves into. But, we, Father, we want to be obedient to you out of love for you, out of respect for you, out of recognition of who you are to us, creator, where we are the created. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen.